Awesome. So I just wanted to talk to you all today about um, just hosting events your whole community in love will love, how to sort of include them in your event planning strategy. I'm going to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk a bit more about how to provide a variety of events, so both online and offline events, and how that's about why that's valuable, and then just how to create safe space for your community and including um, diverse perspectives, which I am so impressed with here at OS Bridge, just the bathroom size and everything. It's just really cool. So um, some things to think about when you're starting out to plan your events is pretty obvious. Who is your community? Um, what are their problems? What are their pain points? And this is really going to help you to build events that people will attend. You want to make sure that your events are giving something to your community that they really need. They're busy people, and you want to make sure that you're thinking about that. Um, for example, at Puppet, our engineers are really busy. So that's our main focus, is how do we um, provide events that have really valuable content, but also um, are accessible for people with limited resources. So kind of piggybacking on this, um, think about your purpose of each of your events. It seems kind of obvious, but you know, really be thoughtful about it when you're starting out. Um, what are your goals? Um, what is your target audience? What are your outcomes? And what are your limitations? So those are your constraints, obviously. Um, some examples at Puppet. So we host these things called Puppet Camps. They're one-day conferences. We hold them all over the world. Um, and their purpose is to meet the needs of our new to Puppet and beginner um, level users. Um, the constraints around those are that we, um, because our community is um, really busy, we bring our camps to them. So they're location constrained. They're also, um, we also solicit talks. So we open a CFP for each camp and we uh, build our content from those talks that are submitted. So we are constrained by the talks that we get. And then also we um, want them to be one day events and, and a low cost. We also um, have a program for our Puppet user groups. Um, and those are community run user groups that we hold all over the world. Um, and the constraints or the target um, for them is that they are community run. That's our purpose. And our constraint for that is that um, you know, we are limited by where we can hold them and, and our community stepping up to host. So what are your current touch points? How can you maximize where you're already touching your community and leverage those connections? So maybe you're hosting meetups and you want to grow those meetups. The example of the Puppet User Group program. When our user groups get big, we look at bringing a Puppet Camp to those locations. Um, we host a lot of local user groups in our office. So we try to partner with those user groups to then um, bring about more events and build out our strategy that way. And what do they value and need? I talked about this a little bit before, but really think about how do you keep them looking like this toast? And really keep them coming and attending and, and think about that. Um, and this is, I've already addressed this a little bit, but we really focus on this with our camps and keeping our content really solid. We've really worked hard on building our CFP process, and I'll talk about how we do that a little bit later, and then keeping, uh, building that really solid agenda with solid talks, and um, bringing that camp to our community, and then keeping the cost pretty nominal. So we try to keep all our camps, no matter where they are, below $150 to attend. Yeah. I'm sorry, that's rude of me. Call for proposals. Yeah, so top proposals. So you want to get the greatest impact out of your event. Um, you, if you're planning a lot of events, like if you're building out a strategy and you want to plan a variety of events, you want to make sure that the resource spend that you're giving yourself 
is manageable and also the bar to attendance is manageable for your community. So they're not having to put out a lot of resources to be a part of the events you plan. Um, an example of this, we have a camp coming up in Minneapolis the week after next and we're doing it in conjunction, in conjunction with DevOps Days Minneapolis. So we're doing it the day before. Um, our community are typically DevOps and engineers and sysadmins. So they're gonna be coming to that conference. Um, and it's easy for them to say like, hey, I can attend this inexpensive camp, get all this really solid content in one day. And then it's only like another hotel room for, their, for them to sell it to their manager, right? And then for us, it's, oops, I'm wearing a microphone. For us, it's um, gonna hopefully pull in more people than would just come to our camp if it were just a camp that we were offering. So it's kind of a, an easy way for both people to be a part of your event. Another example is our Puppet User Group program. So like I said before, they're community-run meetups. Um, it al al having them be run by the community members allows us to scale that program. If we were having to build the agendas and find the speakers and find the venues for those user groups, it would be impossible for us to grow them. And right now we have about 75 cities meeting um, with about 130 meetings a year. So what we, what I do, is I support this program is I'll, you know, contact the user group periodically, like, hey, how's it going, you know? And then they may say, oh, I really need a speaker or oh, I'm really having a hard time finding a place to meet, or I'll check on them like if they haven't met in a while kind of thing. But that's a way lower touch and way less resources for me, and it actually you know, makes it um, easy to run those user groups. And then for them, they are, they're in their region, they only have to devote two hours a month, they can even have them meet quarterly. So then you see how it can be um, the greatest impact for everyone. Um, also, when we plan our events, we plan them um, so that we're not traveling back and forth and back and forth, right? So Puppet Camp DC and Puppet Camp New York, we schedule them in the same week. Another thing to consider is structure. Look, like think about the big picture of how all your events will come together. So you wanna make sure that you're touching people like over time, right? You don't want um, to have like one big event and then, you know, dead silence. Um, so think about how to make a variety of events um, all throughout the year. You want to think about cadence. So um, you want people to be able to rely on your events. So for example, we have um, our contributor events. And those are for our intermediate to advanced level users. Um, and we hope they're, um, they're just, I'll talk more about them later. I'll give you a lot of details about them. But they're, they're just um, one day conferences for our intermediate to advanced users. And we hold one of them in the fall with our annual user conference, PuppetConf. And then we hold one in the winter with FOSDEM, the annual open source conference in Ghent, Belgium. So people can rely on them, right? They're like, oh, it happens every year with FOSDEM, every year with Puppet Comp, and they can plan for it year over year. This is our structure. We have our Puppet Camps. We have, we're hosting about 29 this year um, all over the world, two months on average, two per month on average, um, and those are beginner focus, so those are targeting our new to and beginner uh, community members. And then we have our contributor events, which are more advanced and intermediate focused, and those are happening four times a year, one per quarter. The other two that we do are online, and they're more of hack day events. And then we have our user groups, which meet monthly or quarterly, depending on the group, and we have about 75 of them currently, and then we have our annual Public comp, which includes our entire community. So how can you, it's kind of, I think partnerships is another way of building community. Um, you're, you know, 
I guess getting that greatest impact, like sharing this planning and cost and resource spend. Um, and you're also, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, so you could utilize partners to, you know, pay for food, help with entertainment. Um, they can provide promotional support. Uh, recently, um, our, so we've been struggling um, to get some user groups, kind of get them some content. Um, and so uh, I was talking with Cumulus, who is one of our partners at Puppet, and they're like, oh, we have a user group program, and oh, we need speakers. And we're like, hey, let's trade engineers. And so the Cumulus engineer went to our meetup, and everybody was really happy because she was super knowledgeable, and it gave everyone a lot of really great technical tips and then our engineers went to their user group and spoke and then they offered uh, cumulus offered use of their venue for our user group so it was just a really great way to utilize connections you already have and again that you know making that resource spend as low as possible whenever possible really important set expectations you don't want a beginner user showing up at an advanced level event and nobody's happy you're not happy they're not happy so just set expectations as much as possible ahead of time. Um, things that we consider at Puppet, the experience level of the attendees, obviously I keep talking about that. That's really important for us, for our events and our event focus. Code of conduct, I'm gonna talk a lot more about that later, um, but we, sh we have created a code of conduct at Puppet and we make sure that we share it at every event um, wherever possible. The agenda, obvious, need to, people need to know where to be and what's happening. Any other pertinent information, we try to share any dietary information, anything about accessibility needs. Um, and then we have um, built some guidelines for contributions that we share. So those are just a few things to consider. Um, so at Puppet, we, um, operate under the, the Lean Startup motto, Build, Measure, Learn. And we incorporate that into our event strategy. Um, we're constantly iterating. And we try to touch people across the entire feedback loop. So pre-event, obvious registration. You wanna make sure that you're getting all your logistical info, like what size is your T-shirt, and are you gluten-free, but also Find out a little bit about your audience so that you can gauge them and especially help your speakers out if they're building content. During the event, at camps we ask polls. We ask questions like about, keep them short, like five questions or so. Um, just to gauge audience again and just see what's the makeup. We ask them first thing in the keynote so that speakers that are coming up after that can, can keep that in mind when they're speaking. Social events, uh, at public camps we always hold like a happy hour. It's pretty common in the tech world, but I like to utilize it microphone, um, to really find out what do people think? Like I'm always asking questions like, what did you think of the talk? Or what did you think of the food? A lot of times people will just tell you. Um, sometimes you don't want that, but, um, or tweet about it. But, um, but yeah, I try to get feedback that way. I feel like I get more feedback that way than with a survey, but we still do the surveys. We also email any employees that attended and find out what did they think, what were the good talks, and then the talks that we really liked or got really good feedback rather, um, we're gonna make those notes in our speaker database so we can contact those people in the future. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about surveys. You wanna keep them anonymous. You can put a name field if you want. Like, we'll, um, if we have a drawing and we're, we need names for that, we'll put a note under the name field saying, you know, if you fill this out, then you'll be added to the raffle, but, you know, it's not required to fill out the survey. You wanna have a mix of qualitative and quantitative feedback. Um, we will ask really specific questions around like, what did you think of, like, um, like talk satisfaction, for example, and then we'll do like a one to five scale um, where people can specifically say what they thought, but then we'll ask questions like, how can we improve, or what did we do well? I always try to do both of those, because it's really easy for people to focus on the negative, and I like to hear what went well with the event, too, and get them thinking about it as well, you know, like have them go away with those thoughts. Oh, and the other thing, uh, keep it like three, three minutes or less, five max. That's gonna ensure that people actually fill it out. I think my, I got this 
survey recently was like 30 minutes long. I was like, you're right, I'm not gonna finish this. Um, so an example of how we've used feedback at Puppet, so we, we had this event called Triageathon. I did not come up with that name. Um, and it was about triaging tickets. So we had this huge ticket backlog and it was really painful. And so the goal was we're gonna close as many of these tickets as possible. It's gonna be awesome, our engineers are gonna be so happy. And we had like a ticket board, like a board with like who closed the most tickets. We were doing raffles and it was awesome. And then afterwards, our engineers were like having to reopen all these issues. Like, oh gosh, all this code is terrible, you know. And so it really backfired on us. And um, so we also had people, so we opened our office. It wasn't totally online. So we opened our office and we had people come in, you know. Um, hack with us, close these tickets. And what we found, and we had all this food, it was beautiful, and we, what we found was that people came in that were beginners and they were like, oh yeah, there's all these engineers that can teach me how to contribute. And so our engineers are like trying to teach all these people how to contribute, and that's great, but that wasn't the goal of our event, right? So our, the goal of our event was to close these tickets. Long story short, we decided that we were doing it solely online um, so that we didn't have all that wasted food. Um, we set expectations around it being intermediate to advanced users attending. And we, get, we made a little sheet for beginners, like these are ways that you can contribute as a beginner, but we just really wanted the focus to be on the coding. We changed the name from Triagathon to Pound Puppet Hack because we wanted to focus on it being a hack day and a time for our engineers and our community to come together and work on projects. And we really, really, really set expectations around quality over quantity code. So our raffles shifted from, yay, you closed a lot of tickets, to yay, you're here. So every hour we just pulled a name out of IRC and gave them an Amazon card. So once you build, you do all this work to build your events, you wanna be able to repeat them, right? So you wanna document um, everything. So I, I open a new document for every event, and I write my goal of my event, I include what I want my outcome to be, the timeline of the event, I put every little nitpicky task on the document with a due date, with an owner, and then any meeting that I have, I'm gonna put all my notes in that one document. So I'm not like fishing around everywhere. Um, any meetings that I have, so like I'll meet with our director of events and she'll give me all these swag timelines and all this other logistical um, information that I need to remember and which I will not remember if I don't put in a document. So I'm always like, I just go to the document, open it up, write everything in it. Um, after the event, I'm gonna write what the outcome was. I'm gonna include feedback, any of my survey results, and then, I'm gonna take a step further because I know how my brain works and I can't remember anything. I'm gonna write down, what, do I, what am I gonna do next time? How am I gonna improve this next time? So that when I open it up like six months later, there it is for me and I'm like, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, I remember that now. It's also really helpful when you're talking about the events, you know, to other people in the company and all that kind of good stuff. And it helps when you have a planning committee meeting and people don't take notes and then they don't remember what you decided on. So it's really helpful for that as well. So of course you wanna promote your event. Um, I put internal and external on here because some of our events really rely heavily on um, internal resources. Our uh, Pound Puppet Hack, like I said before, is really engineering heavy, uh, resource heavy. So we're gonna go to the engineering staff meeting and be like, hey, remember this event? This is what it's like. Hey managers, get all your people to join us. Uh, we also work really heavily, I didn't put this on here, but we're always asking engineering, like what, when's the next big release? How can we plan this event so that we're not giving you guys more work to do, right? We we'll always send out a company email. We want the entire company to feel included. Calendar invitation, it's key. We want people to see when this event's happening. And then we'll put it in our company progress updates, our progress updates, departmental progress updates, um, everywhere we can. So externally, we tweet. We start about six to eight weeks out, tweeting, posting, whatever your like avenue is that, that works for you guys. Um, 
blog post pre and a, and a recap. Any swag? We made these stickers for our contributor summit last year. And any other avenues that, that would make sense, like partners, or we'll send our puppet user groups a discount ticket, or organizers get a free ticket for whatever camp is in their region, that kind of thing. Did you get one of those stickers? Do you have one of those stickers? This is one of our longtime public community members. Yep, you're great. He's here. Okay, we, we need to get you one. Um, so I just want to kind of go into detail about how we include level of experience in our events. Um, so our puppet user group program, there are community organized meetups. Um, you know, they're a typical meetup, right? They're going to talk about topics related to puppet. Speakers will be involved. We have them all over the world. We're starting one in Nigeria. I'm super excited. Um, they're community driven, and we target our well. So it's it's changing a little bit. Typically, we try to target intermediate to advanced users as our user groups. Um, we'll have resources for beginners, and we try to encourage our speakers to provide resources for beginners. But typical crowd is intermediate to advanced. Excuse me, and um, that's changing, though, as we build puppet user groups in emerging markets. So for instance, Kuala Lumpur is going to be more new to the IT automation conversation. And we would have a different, uh, a more beginner level focus there. Uh, the, the constraints around puppet user groups, obvious constraints of user groups, where are they going to meet, and how are they going to pay for food, and who's going to talk at them. Other constraints are around. Um, just the type of resources we can provide, and then um, some of these emerging market concerns that we're coming, um, coming up with recently. Our puppet camp program, so the purpose of these camp is to target beginner and new to puppet users. And this sort of grew out of an iteration. So we started to see, oh, well, like 60% of the crowd are beginners. So we're going to start really trying to focus on that. So in our CFP forms, our call for proposal forms, we put in there, and I'll go into more detail about that process in a little bit, but we put in there like, OK, these talks are for beginners. And then on the title of the talk for the camp, we put beginner in parentheses next to them. So we try to like say it as many places. And registration, it's there. So we really try to focus on that. It doesn't always happen, but uh, constraints. Uh, quality of talks that we, we we receive, who signs up, how many people attend, that kind of thing. Those are sort of the constraints. We also try to, we have the logistical constraints of that they're one day. Um, we try to keep the costs low. We bring it to um, certain regions. We can't bring them to all, all regions currently. So that's another constraint. So to talk a little bit more about um, how we solicit talks for our camps, um, we fill out a form. We create a form for each camp. On the form, we're going to include our code of conduct, our speaker waiver and release, our submission deadline, as well as the date of the camp. And we put in there, like, be sure you can attend the camp on this date if you're submitting your talk. You know, like, I mean, it seems obvious, but you want to be, you want to be sure. I, yeah, I don't. Hasn't happened a ton to us, thankfully. I better knock on some wood. But maybe that's why. Who knows? Um, any other criteria? So we ask for people to have 50% of their talk be about puppets. So that's one of our other criteria we include. And then we promote it. Blogs, social media. There's a call for papers website, which is kind of neat. Uh, so they publicize like call for papers like for tons of tech events. And then we give our, like for Puppet Camp Minneapolis, we're going to give our Puppet user group there, the organizers free tickets, and all of the members 50% off tickets. And then we promote it internally. Oh, and with our partners, too, we'll promote it. Contributor events. We do a mix with this. And I've talked a little bit about it already, so I won't bore you. But we have two online two in person, and then we do one event per quarter. And these are for intermediate to advanced users. So what happens at a, at a contributor event is we have, we'll have like a morning, the, in the morning we'll have a talk, like a roadmap talk, 
um, a couple of our um, engineers and product owners will talk about um, <clears throat> upcoming product things. And um, <clears throat> we, part of the reason that we do that is because we really want our contributors to feel like they're getting kind of inside knowledge. You know, these are pe the people that are volunteering tons of their time and energy for us, and we want them to feel like, hey, I'm in the loop. And uh, last year at Puppet Comp, our contributor event there, I mean, there was just so many great conversations, and our engineers got so much great feedback about the ro roadmap decisions. Um, so it's <clears throat> it's a really awesome way to give people give people that, that feeling like, oh wow, I'm in the loop. And, um, and, then, uh, and then great for us too, because we learn a ton. And then everybody, it's kind of an open spaces model. So people just, hey, I'm gonna work on this thing for maybe half an hour, give little short talks about what they're gonna work on so people can find each other. They hack, we have breaks and lunch, and then at the end of the day, everyone comes together and says what they worked on. So it's really fun. Oh, and we also, um, one little like logistical tip thing, if you ever want to do this, we create little plaques for the tables and then people can write on them like what they're going to work on and we can make little tables for people to gather at, which is kind of fun. Puppet Comp, our annual user event, draws all the community together. We have training for two days. We have our contributor event the day before. We have two days of demos and talks and all the fun like puppety goodness. Um, and that's, last year it was in San Francisco, I think like two or three years ago it was here, and then we're holding it again this year in Portland, so that's exciting. Um, constraints, obvious, like they're really resource intensive in a lot of ways to plan. We plan these things for a year, and then we start over. The last way that we sort of try to build community and give to our community is through hosting local user groups in our office here in Portland. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. So um, we go through a vetting process. We have three criteria that we uh, follow. One is that uh, the tech is used in-house. For example, like Agile, we use in-house, so we have the Agile PDX meetup at our office. Uh, user interest, okay, uh, I mean employee interest, so the employee will email me and be like, hey, this user group I attend needs a place to meet. And I'll be like, okay, how to fill out this form. So they fill out this form, and the form is like, hey, you know, that here's our code of conduct. You need to follow it. And here's this information about um, our AV. And if you need a, will you need a security guard? Do you have 50 people? You'll need a security guard. So those kind of like just setting those ex expectations as people are thinking about using our space. And then I get the information. I put it against our criteria, then I respond to the person, and then I give them a lot of documentation that is useful for them, like where are they gonna park, is where, you know, where handicapped people get in, um, security information, uh, AV information, and then I uh, have documentation internally because we require an employee to be at each of the user groups that we host. So, um, I share in internal documentation with them, including our code of conduct. And then um, uh, we have AV that does training of our employees. So we work with our IT department for the AV needs and our facilities managers. Uh, I file a ticket every um, month listing our schedule of user groups for the month and our facilities manager then shares that with our building management. So we, it's a few department approach. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. So now that I've talked a little bit about what to think about and how we do it at Puppet, I want to talk a little bit about online versus in-person events and some, some of the pros and cons around those. I like that picture because they're on a computer but they're together. See, it's like, anyway. Um, so online events, uh, they're online. You can attend them from your sofa kind of cool. I love it because people that maybe live far away from where we're going to hold a camp or far away from Puppet users, um, they, can, they can come and they can be a part of the community. And people in South Africa can hack with people in London. Um, so low resource spend, for example, 
planning and pound puppet hack takes us six weeks. Planning contributor summit takes us several months. So we can provide a variety of events, right? If I were planning a contributor summit every quarter, it would not happen. Um, and then, and we couldn't afford it. Um, and then, you know, uh, it connects with people, connects with lots of people. But then the online event cons are that you're not having that face-to-face -face interaction. You're not having those higher level, deeper conversations um, that are gonna provide a lot um, deeper bonds, but also maybe more efficiency if you're not talking about like your weekend plans. Um, we've had a really hard time measuring participation. We're working on that. We're building some tools in-house for Pound Pub Head Hack to see like um, what tickets are being closed by our community at the event versus the, the tickets that are being closed by our engineers. So that's been a challenge for us. In-person events, you're gonna have extended conversations um, and you know, hopefully greater efficiency working together. Um, and then another in value for us is like at our contributor summit, when we talk about the roadmap, other people can say, hey, what about this thing or that thing? And you can just really have that um, conversation. They are a lot more resource intensive. So the last thing I wanna talk about um, is one of the things that I love most about my job, which is creating safe spaces for people to come together and learn and grow. Um, and we do that at, per at Puppet with the Code of Conduct and our diversity program. I'll talk a little bit about each of those. Code of Conduct. Um, so the Geek Feminism Wiki states, an anti-harassment policy is a core part of creating a safer environment. A policy makes it clear that the conference is willing to act on reports of harassment. Um, you know, you just, you set that expectation. Harassment's not okay. And, and then you, a lot of people will not attend an event anymore without a code of conduct. It's just kind of a, it's just kind of required at, um, for folks to feel protected. A um, couple of good resources, Geek Feminism Wiki. Uh, the PyCon Code of Conduct is another good one. Um, we make sure to publicize our code of conduct at all events. We require our puppet user groups to share them um, with their, on their meetup pages. Uh, we, any user groups that use our office, we have them put our code of conduct on their meetup page. And we share it with the organizers. Um, we also include it in registration for events, on our website, in any print documentation. Um, and then the CFPs when people are, are propose, uh, sending in their proposal for talks. So um, the way that we have used or acted upon our code of conduct at Puppet Comp is we created an escalation committee of a handful of people, trained those people on how to deal with escalations, and then we educated the entire company on about that committee and how that committee worked and how to escalate events to that committee. And that was done through meetings, that was done through internal documentation and online communication as well. So a variety of ways. And here's the three links. So the top one is our code of conduct, Geek Feminism Wiki code of conduct, and the, uh, the PyCon code of conduct. Anybody wants to write those down? And I'm happy to put this up at the end, so if you wanna Write it down. I want to talk a little bit about diversity um, at Puppet Comp. So in 2013, we got seven proposals from women for the event. Um, and this made us sad. So we were like, okay, we're going to develop a diversity program. And um, my coworker, Kara, worked really hard on this. Um, and we quadrupled the number of proposals in 2014. Is really, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I should know that number, but I don't. Sorry. Um, but I was excited that we quadrupled them. Um, and then so we offer discounted, and I think it's free tickets um, to people that are underrepresented in tech. And we also offer travel assistance. We have a women's breakfast at Kabupa Comp every year, and it has grown tremendously year over year. So those are a couple things that we do to um, encourage diversity 
at uh, Puppetcom. The last thing I want to talk about is you. I feel like this is a really important topic. I chose the picture because it's really important for you to get really far away from your event. Um, sometimes during and always after. Um, so uh, I, whenever I plan, put an event on my calendar, the day after will either be a PTO day, depending on the event, like if it's Contributor Summit after Public Comp, it will be a PTO day, um, or a work from home day. And on the work from home days, it doesn't mean get up at seven o'clock, work until seven o'clock. It means get up at nine o'clock, take a nap. Like your day is not gonna be as productive and validate yourself for that. Like it's okay, you just traveled to an event, ran the event, and then traveled back from the event and planned the whole event before that. It's a lot of hard work, it's a big resource spend. Take care of yourself, for example, I just got back from a trip to Australia, and it's four, two days to get there, two days to get back, 17 hour time difference. I ran a trade show booth, and then I ran a camp. So when I got back, I had, it was like a Wednesday when I got back, I think, and so Thursday and Friday were work from home days, and then I was at home Saturday and Sunday, like literally I don't think I left. And then on Monday when I got back, I was like a nice, I was a nice person. But on Thursday, I was not a nice person. Like people did not need to see me in the office. Uh, they didn't really need me to respond to their emails. So just like validate yourself for that. It's okay, do it. A few takeaways. Um, think about your audience. What do they need? What problems do, do they need solved? How can you do that with the least amount of resources for you and your community? Um, think about your big picture. How does it all fit together? Are there any, ho are there any holes? And then, re and then iterate on them. So use your feedback. You know, you might find those holes after you've run some events. You're like, oh, hey, this is not working. I need to do this thing or that thing. And that's okay, too. Take care of yourself. And if you need, like, uh, our director of events, I saw her one day, she was just like, about to fall out, like she was at the espresso machine and she was like, oh my God. I was like, you need to sleep tonight. And so like I saw her the next day, I was like, did you sleep? She was like, yes, I went home. I didn't do anything and I slept all night long. And it was, you know, just an example of it's okay to take time during the planning of an event to rest, take care of yourself so you can keep going. We always say that um, we're starting to feel crispy. So like, I'm starting to feel crispy. I think I need to take a work from home day my thank you slide, all these awesome people. I'm not gonna read it off because we're running short on time and I wanna have time for questions. Thank you. Little gnome house. There's my contact info. Feel free if you're planning stuff and you wanna shoot me an email, ask me a question. Definitely follow me on Twitter, I'll follow you back. And that's our community page on our website with all our stuff that's happening. It's not beautiful, we're working on that. So don't judge me. Questions, Do, and I'll, I'll put that other, whoops, that's wrong. Um, I'll put that other slide up for the code of conduct. Oh. Any questions? Thank you, it's fun.